I've uh, rather cheekily labelled our next guest as Portfolio Man. Um, he's Master of Wellington College, historian, commentator, author, known for his biographies of John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, and a certain David Cameron, which is forthcoming. In uh, 2009, he set up the Wellington Academy, the first state school to carry the name of its founding independent school. He's big on positivity, uh, which led him to co-found the Action for Happiness, which I'm sure he'll talk more about. Please welcome Sir Anthony Selden. Well, it's very nice indeed to uh, be here now. How are you all feeling? How many of you would you say had a great time? Ooh, hi up there. Um, had a great time at school? Hands up. How many of you felt that your school uh, optimally prepared you for the life that you have and the uh, person who you truly want to be? Hands up. So, uh, we had 68.5% uh, of hands up uh, first time uh, round, uh, and 7.262% uh, up on the... So I, don't you just love stats? Uh, they uh, tell us uh, uh, with indescribable accuracy about the world as it is. Well, I'm going to talk to you about education. And by the way... Uh, for those of you who put your hand up first time round, but not the second time round, what are you doing about it? What are you doing to uh, ensure that schools for your own children, for your friends' children, for your neighbours' children, are going to be as good as they can possibly be? How many of you, for example, are governors of schools now? Hands down. That was a 4.3. Five, two. How many would like to be governors in schools? Hey, shame on you. I mean, to be a governor of a uh, school, how many of you have children or would like to have children? How many of you have been at school? Were at school? <laughs> so why are you not uh, wanting to be governors and get stuck into uh, the business of uh, helping uh, uh, others, uh, people, children, uh, experience the kind of schooling that they can and should have because this is what's going wrong with schools. What's going wrong with schools is partly that we're not recruiting the very best people into schools. I would rate uh, schools above, um, uh, above medicine, um, above the law, I mean, that's a close one, but um, above accountancy, above HR, um, as uh, the best imaginable career for anybody who is passionate uh, and full of love and full of fascination at the world. I mean, look at this building that we're in. Look at the incredible design and architecture. That, that look at the uh, miraculous things that happen here. Uh, in this building, how they unfold the human spirit at its very finest. To be in schools is to participate in a world of discovery and to uh, open up the hearts and minds of young people so that they too can experience that. So part of what goes wrong with schools is that we are not attracting the finest and the best of humanity, but it's also because government does not trust schools and therefore it pins schools down to one metric only which is exam success and exams are okay exams are probably a necessary ingredient of a good education though there are good exams like the international baccalaureate and poor exams like GCSE but they're probably necessary but they're not a sufficient condition for a good education because, let's think about it, let's think about your own experience. Schooling is the one opportunity that young people have, their best opportunity to have their souls, their intellects, their hearts, their passions in life discovered, nurtured, 
encouraged, brought out, developed. I mean, that's what education means. It means to lead out. If you look at the root of the word education, it means to draw out. And yet most schools don't draw people out in a process that should continue for life. Most schools narrow people down to a finishing point that is their GCSE or their A-level grade, and then they think, tick, job done. I'm now educated. You're not. The educated person is learning till the day that they die. The great teacher is learning till their last day in the classroom. The great human being, the great professional is, is eager, desperate to learn. Uh, and that's what schools should be doing. And they're not doing that partly because they are giving a very narrow version of what it is to be an educated person. Now, we are all born with these eight different aptitudes or intelligences. Look up the word of Howard Gardner. Uh, and schools concentrate on just two of these eight intelligences, the logical and the linguistic. But there is also the creative and the physical. There's also the social and the personal. The personal means to be an intelligent person. There's also the moral and the spiritual. These are things which are not well done in our exam-ridden education. Uh, and this is where character comes in very, very much. Now, I want you now to just chat to your neighbor about what you think uh, are the values by which you uh, lead your life. Just, just chat to your uh, neighbor. Do, do that now. Uh, what are the values by which you lead your life? Okay. Okay, th thank you. I, I thank you very much, everybody. Hey, hey, everybody, hello, hi. Hi, it, it's, it's, that, it's that person on the stage, remember where you were. Uh, I, I, and notice the release in, in energy. Uh, when actually you are in charge uh, of thinking. Think how much passive so much of education is, how inert it is, how little it actually involves uh, young people themselves, uh, and how exciting and liberating it is when you yourselves are actively learning. We're now going to do something uh, different for uh, 30 seconds. We are going to uh, do something which I would recommend in all your businesses you do and in your own lives every day if you don't do it. Who practices mindfulness? Hands up. All right. So what is it about you guys over here where you are? You know, everyone here just about doing mindfulness. Let's all do it now. Close our eyes. Uh, and everyone close their eyes. And just breathe in and let's have a complete sense of stillness in here. Just complete stillness, let the laughter, let the embarrassment go. They're only fleeting, insubstantial emotions. Connect with the depths inside you. Breathe deeply. And exhale, put the concentration into the breath. Inhale deeply and recognize that you're here now, exhale, and I want you, still with the eyes closed this time, to think through your deepest five values that you want your life to be guided by. Think through what your deepest five values are. And in silence, open your eyes and on your handhelds or on notes, just write those five values down, please. From the deepest core of your being, 
what are the five values that you want to be remembered by? Yup, it might sound morbid, but what do you want people at your memorial to say about you? What, from the core of your being, are your true values? Not necessarily the ones you live, but the ones that you aspire to live by. And then, just put a score by them, in honesty, and not sharing it with anybody, though you might want to share it tonight with loved ones. How far, from naught to 10, are you actually living out these values? From naught low, 10 high, are you living them out? Just, just scan that again. Now look, my contention is that we do not live enough from our deepest values. Why not? Because we're often not very still. Our life goes by in this terrible business and rush. And when we are deeply reflective, that gives us an opportunity to connect with the depths of our own being, our heart of our being, and what we truly want. That's contention number one. Contention number two is that uh, we can educate young people in this, but and schools should be doing much more to develop character education. I'll give you my top five in, in a second now. And contention number three is that in your places of work, you need to embody and personify these values, not as things that you write on boards or come up on screens, but as deeply lived experiences, because people will look at you and they won't think these are the values that they say, she says, he says, he lives by. They'll look at you and see deeply things that you don't see about yourself. If it's truly deep, it will be truly lived. Otherwise, it will appear tinny and thin. It will just appear like a veneer, like a religious person who doesn't live their religion but goes to church or mosque or temple or synagogue every weekend. It isn't, it's got to be deeply lived. And the fourth point is that the more you do this, the more successful your organizations will be. Trust is one of the themes I write books about. High trust organizations are ones that are grounded in great values and principles which are lived, which are lived. And also that you will be much happier people for grounding yourself on your values. So my uh, values are for what they're worth and they are worth absolutely zero more than your own is self-restraint, which is about delayed gratification. And out of that comes health, uh, and the, the, the greatest predictor of success of young people is not their intelligence, not their league table position, but their self-restraint. Fascinating research shows this, I'm sure you know this, that if we can help young people to exercise self-restraint and self-control, this will be a bigger prediction, predictor not only of future happiness, but of future income earning capability. Secondly, courage, uh, and, and courage because I think that we need to positively seek, seek out challenges and things we find difficult. So if you are afraid of heights, find things that uh, will challenge you to be afraid of heights. If you're afraid of public speaking, look as, who, who is afraid here of public speaking? Who actually feels uncomfortable speak, spe, uh, uh, standing up uh, and speaking on a stage? Hands up. Don't actually believe you. I think many more of you probably are, uh, but you probably share another fear, which is the fear of putting your hand up in public. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and but but you, but you know, I'm making the point, the serious point there, which is that the more that you, the way to overcome this is to challenge yourself to do it. So having the courage, you can positively, all of you, grow as human beings into the human beings that you want to be by looking for those, finding the courage to challenge yourself service and, and kindness. Kindness is my third value. 
that, that if you want to be happy, if you want to feel good, do good. It, it is just the most extraordinary law of life uh, existing on every single country on earth, which is that if you want to feel good, do good to other people. And the more that you sacrifice yourself for other people uh, while not ignoring your own self uh, totally, but getting that in a really good balance, the happier you will be. Conversely, the most, think of all the, the unhappy people you know, they will be very self-centered. Depression has that appalling pull, uh, uh, pull about it of self-centeredness. Depressed people are necessarily very self-centered. They will uh, be very, very concerned with themselves. You have to break out of that responsibility. Uh, to be responsible and to display integrity is my fourth. Uh, uh, and that is the most admirable quality for leader. Uh, and to be a leader who is responsible and displays integrity. And my fifth uh, is respect for all, including respect for yourself. Uh, 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 and that's the one that we often forget, as well as respect for all people, respect for the organization you belong to, the traditions of the organization and the future of the organization. So many leaders go wrong because it's all about me, 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 and the difference I can make now. And look at me, hey, look at me, uh, look at my ego, look how great I am. Great leaders who develop who display this quality are thinking about the past and thinking about the future of their organizations. They have this incredible sense of respect uh, that transcends their own puny little egos. Uh, ego is never a great thing. So uh, if you want to, and what I'm saying just to finish off is, and then if there are any questions, is that to live by values, it won't happen unless you allow yourself time for reflection uh, and honesty talking to best friends, people who truly love you and respect you, unless you give time to yourself, stillness to yourself, and reflect on the things that you have and the people, the people who've most inspired you in life. I mean, you know, who are they and what was it about them that made you so admire them? Uh, and otherwise, if we don't do this, if we don't reflect, these moments will go and we will suddenly find that we are out of this job or we're retired or we're dead uh, and you can't do very much about it once you're dead. You know, and it's gone. Uh, you, know, you must find these opportunities and to live by deep values that are totally true to you, not true to anybody else, but true to you, uh, you will not only be more successful at work and more admired and revered and loved, but you will also be far happier. So character, as Aristotle said, is at the heart of all. Thank you. I have no idea. Okay, a time for questions. Okay, that was uh, quite an illuminating uh, speech. Anybody like to ask a question? I can't get my thing. Yes, there's a, can we get a, a, a microphone to the back, please? Any other? Anybody over here? Anybody in the cheap seats up there? Or those expensive seats up there, actually, aren't they? If you want to ask a question, just let me know because we don't have a lot of time. Yes, please Hi. tell us who you are. Um, I'm Carol Ahoyos. I'm recruitment editor at the FT. And I wanted to ask you to elaborate a bit about grit, which we're hearing a lot about um, as a predictive success as well as some of the things you have listed and what your views are on that. Thank you. Okay, so, so grit, and if you want to follow grit, uh, look at the work of Angela Duckworth at the University of Pennsylvania, look more generally at the work of Marty Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania and Positive Psychology, which when Wellington started teaching happiness or well-being in 2006, we grounded our work on this. And very briefly, Seligman and Duckworth um, wondered why so much of psychology is obsessed with 98% uh, of academic journals on psychology were about aberration, were about eating disorders, about addiction, about depression, about psychosis. Uh, there weren't the studies about the ingredients of uh, successful people, flourishing relationships, uh, remarkable companies. You know, why are some companies so great? Uh, and they have found that a core ingredient of flourishing people and relationships uh, and companies is, is this word grit, uh, which is about an inner resilience, an ability um, to, to uh, cope with adversity. What we do know about life is that uh, you cannot affect 
uh, the shit that happens. You know, stuff, bad stuff is going to happen to us. My mum died last week. We had the funeral yesterday. We made it a, a, a positive experience for uh, our children who are having a lot to cope with at the moment for all kinds of reasons. So that was a very practical recent example for us. We cannot affect what happens. We can only affect uh, the way we respond to it. I mean, as Shakespeare said, was it Shakespeare? Nothing is good or bad, but thinking uh, makes it so. It's the thinking, and, and you learn how to uh, react uh, positively um, to, to, a, to, to what happens. And this is a quality which can be taught at schools, taught at university, and which we can all develop. So grit and resilience, Angela Duckworth. Uh, there's also a book by Paul Tuff, um, uh, 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 Paul Tuff, which I'd recommend to you, my influence Michael Gove, and you can see it in KIPP schools, charter schools in America, you can see it in Riverdale, um, a, a school just uh, to the north of Manhattan, uh, you can see it in schools like Kings Langley uh, here in the UK. Many state schools are beginning to practice grit. Quick answer, probably too long. Um, go for it. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, it, it, grit is something not that other people can have, it's something that all of you need to develop. Wherever you are now with your grittiness, uh, you can develop it uh, because stuff is going to happen to you that is bad. You will lose your job, uh, things will happen to you, and you know, rather than coping when the bad stuff happens, uh, make hay while the sun shines. I mean, Gordon Brown squandered um, the, the, the wealth of the nation when the times were good. He didn't hoard it. You know, we would be in a much stronger position now if he and Ed Balls had uh, responded with more responsibility up to 2010. So this is a good time for you now. This is the time to be working on building up your own grit and resilience. Another question. There's a question here. Thanks uh, Can we get a, a microphone quickly here? Yeah. Uh, any, do, do any belt it out. I'll repeat it. Yeah. I'm a firm believer in positive psychology. Okay. Believer in positive psychology. Yep. How do you leverage people's strengths? Okay, so, so, so a lot of it is based about uh, people's strengths. Well, we all know bum uh, leaders. We've all had them, like teachers. I, I, I was just thinking about this yesterday. My wife uh, was saying, who was at a school called South Hampstead High School, uh, that her head said to her when she got her A-level, a she got uh, three A grades, and the head teacher said to her, well, uh, I can't pretend that we're not surprised, Joanna. Um, and and think, of, think of those leaders you've had who actually depressed you uh, and who, um, who a key ingredient in their arsenal of, of power is denigration, uh, is finding the weaknesses. We always see it in other people. We rarely see it in ourselves. Um, uh, using denigration as a way of asserting your authority over other people, subtly finding out uh, people's weaknesses. Well, this is like all of positive psychology. It's standing everything on its head, and it's, it's helping people to develop their strengths. And this is what a great leader does. Think of your great teachers. Your great teachers didn't make you feel small. Uh, uh, they believed in you, not stupidly, not wildly, not saying you could play in the first or that you, you were a brilliant artist if you weren't, but they truly saw what your strengths were, and they developed those. And this is what great leaders do. And that's why we love great leaders and why they can and should be successful, because they bring out the very best. In, the, in all your organizations, as a wild thought, you're probably operating at 40% of your productivity. If you actually um, uh, develop truly uh, the self-belief on, on a grounded optimism basis of your employees, they would be, and yourselves, and yourselves, uh, with your own strengths, uh, you would be achieving so much more than you do at the moment. We've run out of time. We Thank have run you out of time. so much. Thank it you was so such much a for inviting me. How Thank brilliant. You. Thank you very much.